Five American Contributions to Civilization by Charles William Eliot. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Looking back over 40 centuries of history, we observe that many nations have made characteristic contributions to the progress of civilization, the beneficent effects of which have been permanent, although the races that made them may have lost their national form and organization, or their relative standing among the nations of the earth. Thus, the Hebrew race, during many centuries, made supreme contributions to religious thought, and the Greek, during the brief climax to the race, to speculative philosophy, architecture, sculpture, and the drama. The Roman people developed military colonization, aqueducts, roads, and bridges, and a great body of public law, large parts of which still survive, and the Italians of the Middle Ages and the Renaissance developed ecclesiastical organization and the fine arts as tributary to the splendor of the church and to municipal luxury. England for several centuries has contributed to the institutional development of representative government and public justice. The Dutch, in the 16th century, made a superb struggle for free thought and free government. France, in the 18th century, taught the doctrine of individual freedom and the theory of human rights. And Germany, at two periods within the 19th century, 50 years apart, proved a vital force of the sentiment of nationality. I ask you to consider with me what characteristic and durable contributions the American people have been making to the progress of civilization. The first and principal contribution to which I shall ask your attention is the advance made in the United States, not in theory only, but in practice, toward the abandonment of war as the means of settling disputes between nations, the substitution of discussion and arbitration, and avoidance of armaments. If the intermittent Indian fighting and the brief contest with the Barbary Corsairs be disregarded, the United States have had only four years and a quarter of international war in 107 years since the adoption of the Constitution. Within the same period, the United States have been party to 47 arbitrations, being more than half of all that have taken place in the modern world. The questions settled by these arbitrations have been just such as have commonly caused wars, namely questions of boundary, fish damage caused by war or civil disturbances, and injuries to commerce. Some of them were of great magnitude, the four made under the Treaty of Washington, May 8, 1871, being the most important that have ever taken place, confident in their strength and relying on their ability to adjust international differences. The United States have habitually maintained, by voluntary enlistment for short terms, a standing army and a fleet which, in proportion to the population, are insignificant. The beneficent effects of this American contribution to civilization are of two sorts. In the first place, the direct evils of war and of preparations for war have been diminished. And secondly, the influence of the war spirit on the perennial conflict between the rights of the single personal unit and the powers of the multitude that constitute organized society, or, in other words, between individual freedom and collective authority, has been reduced to the lowest terms. War has been, and still is, the school of collectivism, the warrant of tyranny. Century after century, tribes, clans, and nations have sacrificed the liberty of the individual to the fundamental necessity of being strong for combined defense or attack in war. Individual freedom is crushed in war, for the nature of war is inevitably despotic. It says to the private person, obey without a question, even unto death, die in this stitch without knowing why, walk into that deadly thicket, mount this embankment, behind which are men who will try to kill you, lest you should kill them, make part of an immense machine for blind destruction, cruelty, rapine, and killing. At this moment, every young man in the continental Europe learns the lesson of absolute military obedience and feels himself subject to this crushing power of militant society against which no rights of the individual to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness avail anything. This pernicious influence inherent in the social organization of all continental Europe during many centuries, the American people have for generations escaped and they show other nations how to escape it. I ask your attention to the favorable conditions under which this contribution of the United States to civilization has been made. There has been a deal of fighting on the American continent during the past three centuries, but it has not been of the sort which most imperils liberty. The first European colonists who occupied portions of the coast of North America encountered in the Indians men of the Stone Age, who ultimately had to be resisted and quelled by force. The Indian races were at the stage of development thousands of years behind that of the Europeans. They could not be assimilated. For the most part, they could not be taught or even reasoned with. 
with a few exceptions, they had to be driven away by prolonged fighting or subdued by force so that they would live peacefully with the whites. This warfare, however, has always had it in for the whites a large element of self-defense. The homes and families of the settlers were to be defended against a stealthily pitiless foe. Constant exposure to the attacks of savages was only one of the formidable dangers and difficulties which for a hundred years the early settlers had to meet and which developed in them courage, hardiness, and persistence. The French and English wars in the North American continent, always more or less mixed with Indian warfare, were characterized by race hatred and religious animosity, two of the commonest causes of war in all ages. But they did not tend to fasten upon the English colonists any objectionable public authority or to contract the limits of individual liberty. They furnished a school of martial qualities at small cost to liberty. In the War of Independence, there was a distinct hope and purpose to enlarge individual liberty. It made possible a confederation of the colonies and ultimately the adoption of the Constitution of the United States. It gave to the 13 colonies a lesson in collectivism, but it was a needed lesson on the necessity of combining their forces to resist an oppressive external authority. The War of 1812 is properly called the Second War of Independence, for it was truly a fight for liberty and for the rights of neutrals, in resistance of the impressment of seamen and other oppressions growing out of European conflicts. The Civil War of 1861 to 1865 was way on the side of the North, primarily to prevent the dismemberment of the country, and secondarily and incidentally to destroy the institution of slavery. On the northern side, it therefore called a generous element of popular ardor in defense of free institutions, and though it temporarily caused centralization of great powers in the government, it did as much to promote individual freedom as it did to strengthen public authority. In all this series of fightings, the main motives were self-defense, resistance to oppression, the enlargement of liberty, and the conservation of national acquisitions. The war with Mexico, it is true, was of a wholly different type. This was a war of conquest, and of conquest chiefly in the interest of African slavery. It was also an unjust attack made by a powerful people on a feeble one, but it lasted less than two years, and the number of men engaged in it was at no time large. Moreover, by the treaty which ended the war, the conquering nation agreed to pay the conquered $18 million in partial compensation for some of the territory wrested from it, instead of demanding a huge war indemnity, as the European way is. Its results contradicted the anticipations both of those who advocated and of those who opposed it. It was one of the wrongs which prepared the way for the Great Rebellion, but its direct evils were of moderate extent and it had no effect on the perennial conflict between individual liberty and public power. In the meantime, partly as a result of Indian fighting and the Mexican War, but chiefly through purchases and arbitrations, the American people had acquired a territory so extensive, so defended by oceans, gulfs, and great lakes, and so intersected by those great natural highways, navigable rivers, that it would obviously be impossible for any enemy to overrun or subdue it. The civilized nations of Europe, Western Asia, and Northern Africa have always been liable to hostile incursions from without. Over and over again, barbarous hordes have overthrown established civilizations, and at this moment there is not a nation of Europe which does not feel obliged to maintain monstrous armaments for defense against its neighbors. The American people have long been exempt from such terrors, and now absolutely free from this necessity of keeping in readiness to meet heavy assaults. The absence of a great standing army and of a large fleet has been a main characteristic of the United States, in contrast with the other civilized nations. This has been a great inducement to immigration and a prime cause of the country's rapid increase in wealth. The United States have no formidable neighbor except Great Britain and Canada. In April 1817, by a convention made between Great Britain and the United States, without much public discussion or observation, these two powerful nations agreed that each should keep on the Great Lakes only a few police vessels of insignificant size and armament. This argument was made but four years after Perry's naval victory on Lake Erie, and only three years after the burning of Washington by a British force. It was one of the first acts of Monroe's first administration, and it would be difficult to find in all history a more judicious and effectual agreement between two powerful neighbors. For 80 years, this beneficent convention has helped to keep the peace. The European way would have been to build competitive fleets, dockyards, and fortresses, all of which have helped to bring on war during the periods of mutual exasperation which have occurred since 1817. 
Monroe's second administration was signalized six years later by the declaration that the United States would consider any attempt on the part of the Holy Alliance to extend their system to any portion of this hemisphere as dangerous to the peace and safety of the United States. This announcement was designed to prevent the introduction of the American continent of the horrible European system, with its balance of power, its alliances offensive and defensive in opposing groups, and its perpetual armaments on an enormous scale. That a declaration expressly intended to promote peace and prevent armaments should now be perverted into an argument for arming and for a belligerent public policy is an extraordinary perversion of the true American doctrine. The ordinary causes of war between nation and nation have been lacking in America for the last century and a quarter. How many wars in the world's history have been due to contending dynasties? How many of the most cruel and protracted wars have been due to religious strife? How many to race hatred? No one of these causes of war has been efficacious in America since the French were overcome in Canada by the English in 1759. Looking forward into the future, we find it impossible to imagine circumstances under which any of these common causes of war can take effect on the North American continent. Therefore, the ordinary motives for maintaining armaments in time of peace and concentrating the powers of government in such a way as to interfere with individual liberty have not been in play in the United States as among the nations of Europe and are not likely to be. Such have been favorable conditions under which America has made its best contribution to the progress of our race. There are some people of a perverted sentimentality who occasionally lament the absence in our country of the ordinary inducements to war on the ground that war develops certain noble qualities in some of the combatants and gives opportunity for the practice of heroic virtues such as courage, loyalty, and self-sacrifice. It is further said that prolonged peace makes nations effeminate, luxurious, and materialistic and substitutes for the high ideals of the patriot soldier, the low ideals of the farmer, manufacturer, tradesman, and pleasure seeker. This view seems to me to err in two opposite ways. In the first place, it forgets that war, in spite of the fact that it develops some splendid virtues, is the most horrible occupation that human beings can possibly engage in. It is cruel, treacherous, and murderous. Defensive warfare, particularly on the part of a weak nation against powerful invaders or oppressors, excites a generous sympathy. But for every heroic defense, there must be an attack by a preponderating force, and war being the conflict of the two must be judged by its moral effects not on one party, but on both parties. Moreover, the weaker party may have the worst cause. The immediate ill effects of war are bad enough, but its after effects are generally worse, because indefinitely prolonged and indefinitely wasting and damaging. At this moment, 31 years after the end of the Civil War, there are two great evils afflicting our country, which took their rise in that war, namely the belief of a portion of our people in money without intrinsic value, or worth less than its face, and made current solely by the act of Congress and the payment of immense annual sums and pensions. It is the paper money delusion born of the Civil War which generated and supports the silver money delusion of today. As a consequence of the war, the nation has paid two trillion dollars in pensions within 33 years. So far as pensions are paid to disabled persons, they are a just and inevitable but unproductive expenditure. So far as they are paid to persons who are not disabled, men or women, they are in the main not only unproductive but demoralizing, so far as they promote the marriage of young women to old men as pecuniary speculation, they create a grave social evil. It is impossible to compute or even imagine the losses and injuries already inflicted by the fiat money delusion, and we know that some of the worst evils of the pension system will go on for a hundred years to come, unless the laws about widows' pension are changed for the better. It is a significant fact that of the existing pensioners of the War of 1812, only 21 are surviving soldiers or sailors, while 3,826 are widows. War gratifies or used to gratify the combative instinct of mankind, but it gratifies also the level of plunder, destruction, cruel discipline, and arbitrary power. It is doubtful whether fighting with modern appliances will continue to gratify the savage instinct of combat, for it is not likely that in the future two opposing lines of men can ever meet, or any line or column reach an enemy's entrenchments. The machine gun can only be compared to the Sith, which cuts off every blade of the grass within its sweep. It has made cavalry charges impossible, just as the modern ironclad has made impossible the maneuvers of one of Nelson's fleets. 
On land, the only mode of approach of one line to another must hereafter be by concealment, crawling, or surprise. Naval actions will henceforth be conflicts between opposing machines, guided, to be sure, by men, but it will be the best machine that wins, and not necessarily the most enduring men. War will become a contest between treasuries or war chests, for now that 10,000 men can fire away a million dollars worth of ammunition in an hour, no poor nation can long resist a rich one, unless there be some extraordinary difference between the two in mental and moral strength. The view that war is desirable omits also the consideration that modern social and industrial life affords ample opportunities for the courageous and loyal discharge of duty apart from the barbarities of warfare. There are many serviceable occupations in civil life which call for all the courage and fidelity of the best soldier, and for more of his independent responsibility because not pursued in masses or under the immediate command of superiors. Such occupations are those of the locomotive engineer, the electric line the railroad brakeman, the city fireman, and the policeman. The occupation of a locomotive engineer requires constantly a high degree of skill, alertness, fidelity, and resolution, and at any moment may call for heroic self-forgetfulness. The occupation of a lineman requires all the courage and endurance of a soldier whose lurking foe is mysterious and invisible. In the two years, 1893 and 1894, there were 34,000 trainmen killed and wounded on the railroads of the United States, and 25,000 other railroad employees besides. I need not enlarge on the dangers of the fireman's occupation or on the disciplined gallantry with which its risks are habitually incurred. The policeman in large cities needs every virtue of the best soldier, for in the discharge of many of its most important duties he is alone. Even the female occupation of the trained nurse illustrates every heroic quality which can possibly be exhibited in war, for she, simply in the way of duty, without the stimulus of excitement or companionship, runs risks from which many a soldier in hot blood would shrink. No one need be anxious about the lack of opportunities in civilized life for the display of heroic qualities. New industries demand new forms of fidelity and self-sacrificing devotion. Every generation develops some new kind of hero. Did it ever occur to you that the scab is a credible type of 19th century hero? In defense of his rights as an individual, he deliberately incurs the reprobation of many of his fellows and runs the immediate risk of bodily injury or even of death. He also risks his livelihood for the future, and thereby the well-being of his family. He steadily asserts in action his right to work on such conditions as he sees fit to make, and, in so doing, he exhibits remarkable courage and renders a great service to his fellow men. He is generally a quiet, unpretending, silent person who values his personal freedom more than the society and approbation of his mates. Often he is impelled to work by family affection, and this fact does not diminish his heroism. There are file closers behind the line of battle of the bravest regiment. Another modern personage who needs heroic endurance and often exhibits it is a public servant who steadily does his duty against the outcry of a party press bent on perverting his every word and act. Through the telegram, cheap postage, and the daily newspaper, the forces of hasty public opinion can now be concentrated and expressed within a rapidity and intensity unknown to preceding generations. In consequence, the independent thinker or actor, or the public servant, when his thoughts or acts run counter to prevailing popular or party opinions, encounters sudden and intense obloquy, which to many temperaments is very formidable. That habit of submitting to the opinion of the majority which democracy fosters renders the storm of detraction and culminy all the more difficult to endure, makes it, indeed, so intolerable to many citizens that they will conceal or modify their opinions rather than endure it. Yet the very breath of life for a democracy is free discussion and the taking account of all opinions honestly held and reasonably expressed. The unreality of the vilification of public men in the modern press is often revealed by the sudden change when an eminent public servant retires or dies. A man for whom no words of derision or condemnation were strong enough yesterday is recognized tomorrow as an honorable and serviceable person and a credit to his country. Nevertheless, this habit of partisan ridicule and denunciation in the daily reading matter of millions of people calls for a new kind of courage and toughness in public men, and calls for it not in brief moments of excitement only, but steadily year in and year out. 
Clearly, there is no need of bringing on wars in order to breed heroes. Civilized life affords plenty of opportunities for heroes, and for a better kind than war or any other savagery has ever produced. Moreover, none but lunatics would set a city on fire in order to give opportunities for heroism to firemen, or introduce the cholera or yellow fever to give physicians and nurses opportunity for practicing disinterested devotion, or condemn thousands of people to extreme poverty in order that some well-to-do persons might practice a beautiful charity. It is equally crazy to to advocate war on the ground that it is a school for heroes. Another misleading argument for war needs brief notice. It is said that a war is a school of national development, that a nation, when conducting a great war, puts forth prodigious exertions to raise money, supply munitions, enlist troops, and keep them in the field, and often gets a clearer conception and a better control of its own material and moral forces while making these unusual exertions. The nation which means to live in peace necessarily forgoes, it is said, these valuable opportunities of abnormal activity. Naturally, such a nation's abnormal activities devoted to destruction would be diminished, but its normal and abnormal activities devoted to construction and improvement ought to increase. One great reason for the rapid development of the United States since the adoption of the Constitution is the comparative exemption of the whole people from war, dread of war, and preparations for war. The energies of the people have been directed into other channels. The progress of applied science during the present century and the new ideals concerning the well-being of human multitudes have opened great fields for the useful application of a national energy. This immense territory of ours, stretching from ocean to ocean, and for the most part but imperfectly developed and sparsely settled, affords a broad field for the beneficent application of the richest national forces during an indefinite period. There is no department of national activity in which we would not advantageously put forth much more force than we now expend, and there are great fields which we have never cultivated at all. As examples, I may mention the post office, national sanitation, public works, and education. Although great improvements have been made during the past 50 years in the collection and delivery of mail matter, much still remains to be done both in city and country, and particularly in the country. In the mail facilities secured to our people, we are far behind several European governments, whereas we ought to be far in advance of every European government except Switzerland, since the rapid interchange of ideas and the promotion of family, friendly, and commercial intercourse are of more importance to a democracy than to any other form of political society. Our national government takes very little pains about the sanitation of the country or its deliverance from injurious insects and parasites, yet these are matters of gravest interest with which only the government can deal, because action by separate states or cities is necessarily ineffectual. To fight pestilences needs quite as much energy, skill, and courage as to carry on war. Indeed, the foes are more insidious and awful, and the means of resistance less obvious. On the average and the large scale, the professions which heal and prevent disease and mitigate suffering call for much more ability, constancy, and devotion than the professions which inflict wounds and death of all sorts of human misery. Our government has never touched the important subject of national roads, by which I mean not railroads, but common highways. Yet here is a great subject for beneficent action throughout government, in which we need only go for our lessons to little Republican Switzerland. Inundations and droughts are great enemies of the human race, against which government ought to create defenses because private enterprise cannot cope with such widespreading evils. Popular education is another great field in which public activity should be indefinitely enlarged, not so much through the action of the federal government, though even there a much more effective supervision should be provided than now exists, but through the action of states, cities, and towns. We have hardly begun to apprehend the fundamental necessity and infinite value of public education or to appreciate the immense advantages to be derived from additional expenditure for it. What prodigious possibilities of improvement are suggested by the single statement that the average annual expenditure for the schooling of a child in the United States is only about $18. Here is a cause which requires from hundreds of thousands of men and women keen intelligence, hearty devotion to duty, and a steady uplifting and advancement of all its standards and ideals. 
The system of public instruction should embody for coming generations all the virtues of the medieval church. It should stand for the brotherhood and unity of all classes and conditions. It should exalt the joys of the intellectual life above all material delights, and it should produce the best constituted and most wisely directed intellectual and moral host that the world has seen. In view of such unutilized opportunities as these for the beneficent application of great public forces, does it not seem monstrous that war should be advocated on the ground that it gives occasion for rallying and using the national energies? The second eminent contribution which the United States have made to civilization is there through acceptance, in theory and practice, of the widest religious toleration. As a means of suppressing individual liberty, the collective authority of the church, when elaborately organized in a hierarchy directed by one head and absolutely devoted in every rank to its service, comes next in proved efficiency to that concentration of powers in government which enables it to carry on war effectively. The Western Christian Church, organized under the Bishop of Rome, acquired, during the Middle Ages, a centralized authority which quite overrode both the temporal ruler and the rising spirit of nationality. For a time, Christian church and Christian states acted together, just as in Europe, during many earlier centuries. The great powers of civil and religious rule have been united. The Crusades marked the climax of the power of the church. Therefore, church and state were often in conflict, and during this prolonged conflict the seeds of liberty were planted, took root, and made some steady growth. We can see now, as we look back on the history of Europe, how fortunate it was that the colonization of North America by Europeans was deferred until after the period of the Reformation, and especially until after the Elizabethan period in England, the Luther period in Germany, and the splendid struggle of the Dutch for liberty in Holland. The founders of New England and New York were men who had imbibed the principles of resistance both to arbitrary civil power and to universal ecclesiastical authority. Hence it came about that within the territory now covered by the United States, no single ecclesiastical organization ever obtained a wide and oppressive control, and that in different parts of this great region churches, very unlike in doctrine and organization, were almost simultaneously established. It has been an inevitable consequence of this condition of things that the church as a whole in the United States has not been an effective opponent of any form of human rights. For generations it has been divided into numerous sects and denominations, no one of which has been able to claim more than a tenth of the population as its adherents, and the practices of these numerous denominations have been profoundly modified by political theories and practices and by social customs natural to new communities formed under the prevailing conditions of free intercourse and rapid growth. The constitutional prohibition of religious tests as qualifications for office gave the United States the leadership among the nations in disassociating theological opinions and political rights. No one denomination or ecclesiastical organization in the United States has held great properties or has had the means of conducting its ritual with costly pomp or its charitable works with imposing liberality. No splendid architectural exhibitions of church power have interested or overawed the population. On the contrary, there has prevailed in general a great simplicity in public worship until very recent years. Some splendors have been lately developed by religious bodies in the great cities, but these splendors and luxuries have been almost simultaneously exhibited by the religious bodies of very different, not to say opposite, kinds. Thus, in New York City, the Jews, the Greek Church, the Catholics, and the Episcopalians have all erected or undertaken to erect magnificent edifices, but these recent demonstrations of wealth and zeal are so distributed among differing religious organizations that they cannot be imagined to indicate a coming centralization of ecclesiastical influence adverse to individual liberty. In the United States, the great principle of religious toleration is better understood and more firmly established than in any other nation of the earth. It is not only embodied in legislation, but also completely recognized in the habits and customs of good society. Elsewhere, it may be a long road from legal to social recognition of religious liberty, as the example of England shows. This recognition alone would mean, 
to any competent student of history that the United States had made an unexampled contribution to the reconciliation of just governmental power with just freedom for the individual, inasmuch as the partial establishment of religious toleration has been the main work of civilization during the past four centuries. In view of this characteristic and an infinitely beneficent contribution to human happiness and progress, how pitiable seem the temporary outbursts of bigotry and fanaticism, which have occasionally marred the fair record of our country in regard to religious toleration. If anyone imagines that this American contribution to civilization is no longer important, that the victory for toleration has been already won, let him recall the fact that the last years of the 19th century have witnessed two horrible religious persecutions, one by a Christian nation, the other by a Muslim, one of the Jews by Russia, and the other of the Armenians by Turkey. The third characteristic contribution which the United States have made to civilization has been the safe development of a manhood suffrage nearly universal. The experience of the United States has brought out several principles with regard to the suffrage which have not been clearly apprehended by some eminent political philosophers. In the first place, American experience has demonstrated the advantages of a gradual approach to universal suffrage over a sudden leap. Universal suffrage is not the first and only means of attaining democratic government. Rather, it is the ultimate goal of successful democracy. It is not a specific for the cure of all political ills. On the contrary, it may itself easily be the source of great political evils. The people of the United States feel its dangers today when constituencies are large. It aggravates the well-known difficulties of party government, so that many of the ills which threaten democratic communities at this moment, whether in Europe or America, proceed from the breakdown of party government rather than from failures of universal suffrage. The methods of party government were elaborated where suffrage was limited and constituencies were small. Manhood suffrage has not worked perfectly well in the United States or in any other nation where it has been adopted, and it is not likely very soon to work perfectly anywhere. It is like freedom of the will for the individual, the only atmosphere in which virtue can grow, but an atmosphere in which sin can also grow. Like freedom of the will, it needs to be surrounded with checks and safeguards, particularly in the childhood of the nation, but, like the freedom of the will, it is the supreme good, the goal of perfected democracy. Secondly, like freedom of the will, universal suffrage has an educational effect, which has been mentioned by many writers but has seldom been clearly apprehended or adequately described. This educational effect is produced in two ways. In the first place, the combination of individual freedom with social mobility, which a wide suffrage tends to produce, permits the capable to rise through all grades of society, even within a single generation, and this freedom to rise is intensely stimulating to personal ambition. Thus, every capable American, from youth to age, is bent on bettering himself in his condition. Nothing can be more striking than the contrast between the mental condition of an average American belonging to laborious classes, but conscious that he can rise to the top of the social scale, and that of a European mechanic, peasant, or tradesman, who knows that he cannot rise out of his class, and is content with his hereditary classification. The state of mind of the American prompts to constant struggle for self-improvement and the acquisition of all sorts of property and power. In the second place, it is a direct effect of a broad suffrage that the voters become periodically interested in the discussion of grave public problems, which carry their minds away from the routine of their daily labor and household experience out into larger fields. The instrumentalities of this prolonged education have been multiplied and improved enormously within the last 50 years. In no field of human endeavor have the fruits of the introduction of steam and electrical power been more striking than the methods of reaching multitudes of people with instructive narratives, expositions, and arguments. The multiplication of newspapers, magazines, and books is only one of the immense developments in the means of reaching the people. The advocates of any public cause now have it in their power to provide hundreds of papers with the same copy or the same plates for simultaneous issue. The mails provide the means of circulating millions of leaflets and pamphlets. The interest in the minds of the people which prompts to the reading of these multiplied communications comes from the frequently recurring elections. The more difficult the intellectual problem presented in any given election, the more educative the effect of the discussion. Many modern industrial and financial problems are extremely difficult, even for highly educated men. 
As subjects of earnest thought and discussion on the farm and in the workshop, factory, rolling mill, and mine, they supply a mental training for millions of adults, the like of which has never before been seen in the world. In these discussions, it is not only the receptive masses that are benefited. The classes that supply the appeals to the masses are also benefited in a high degree. There is no better mental exercise for the most highly trained man than the effort to expound a difficult subject in so clear a way that the untrained man can understand it. In a republic in which the final appeal is to manhood suffrage, the educated minority of the people is constantly stimulated to exertion by the instinct of self-preservation as well as by love of country. They see dangers and proposals made to universal suffrage, and they must exert themselves to ward off those dangers. The position of the educated and well-to-do classes is a thoroughly wholesome one in this respect. They cannot depend for the preservation of their advantages on land-owning, hereditary privilege, or any legislation not equally applicable to the poorest and humblest citizen. They must maintain their superiority by being superior. They cannot live in a too safe corner. I touch here on a misconception which underlies much of the criticism of universal suffrage. It is commonly said that the rule of the majority must be the rule of the most ignorant and incapable, the multitude being necessarily uninstructed as to taxation, public finance, and foreign relations, and untrained to active thought on such difficult subjects. Now, universal suffrage is merely a convention as to where the last appeal shall lie for the decision of public questions, and it is the rule of the majority only in this sense. The educated classes are undoubtedly a minority, but it is not safe to assume that they monopolize the good sense of the community. On the contrary, it is very clear that native good judgment and good feeling are not proportional to education, and that among a multitude of men who have only an elementary education, a large proportion will possess both good judgment and good feeling. Indeed, persons who can neither read nor write may possess a large share of both, as is constantly seen in regions where the opportunities for education and childhood have been scanty or inaccessible. It is not to be supposed that the cultivated classes under a regime of universal suffrage are not going to try to make their cultivation felt in the discussion and disposal of public questions. Any result under universal suffrage is a complex effect of the discussion of the public question in hand by the educated classes in the presence of the comparatively uneducated, when a majority of both classes taken together is ultimately to settle a question. In practice, both classes divide on almost every issue. But, in any case, if the educated classes cannot hold their own with the uneducated, by means of their superior physical, mental, and moral qualities, they are obviously unfit to lead society. With education should come better powers of argument and persuasion, a stricter sense of honor. With education should come better powers of argument and persuasion, a stricter sense of honor, and a greater general effectiveness. With these advantages, the educated classes must undoubtedly appeal to the less educated and try to convert them to their way of thinking. But this is a process which is good for both sets of people. Indeed, it is the best possible process for the training of freemen, educated or uneducated, rich or poor. It is often assumed that the educated classes become impotent in a democracy because the representatives of these classes are not exclusively chosen to public office. This argument is a very fallacious one. It assumes that the public offices are the places of greatest influence, whereas in the United States at least, that is conspicuously not the case. In a democracy, it is important to discriminate influence from authority. Rulers and magistrates may or may not be the persons of influence, but many persons of influence never become rulers, magistrates, or representatives in parliaments or legislatures. The complex industries of a modern state and its innumerable corporation services offer great fields for administrative talent which were entirely unknown to preceding generations, and these new activities attract many ambitious and capable men more strongly than the public service. These men are not on in which the final appeal is to manhood suffrage. The educated minority of these people is constantly stimulated to exertion by the instinct of self-preservation as well as by love of country. They see dangers and proposals made to universal suffrage, and they must exert themselves to ward off those dangers. The position of the educated and the well-to-do classes is a thoroughly wholesome one in its respect. They cannot depend for the preservation of their advantages on land-owning, hereditary privilege, or any legislation not equally applicable to the poorest and humblest citizen. 
They must maintain their superiority by being superior. They cannot live in a too safe corner. I touch here on a misconception which underlies much of the criticism of universal suffrage. It is commonly said that the rule of the majority must be the rule of the most ignorant and incapable, the multitude being necessarily uninstructed as to taxation, public finance, and foreign relations, and untrained to active thought on such difficult subjects. Now, universal suffrage is merely a convention as to where the last appeal shall lie for the decision of public questions, and it is the rule of the majority only in this sense. The educated classes are undoubtedly a minority, but it is not safe to assume that they monopolize the good sense of the community. On the contrary, it is very clear that native good judgment and good feeling are not proportional to education, and that among a multitude of men who have only an elementary education, a large proportion will possess both good judgment and good feeling. Indeed, persons who can neither read nor write may possess a large share of both, as is constantly seen in regions where the opportunities for education and childhood have been scanty or inaccessible. It is not to be supposed that the cultivated classes under a regime of universal suffrage are not going to try to make their cultivation felt in the discussion and disposal of public questions. Any result under universal suffrage is a complex effect of the discussion of the public question in hand by the educated classes in the presence of the comparatively uneducated, when a majority of both classes taken together is ultimately to settle a question. In practice, both classes divide on almost every issue. But, in any case, if the educated classes cannot hold their own with the uneducated, by means of their superior physical, mental, and moral qualities, they are obviously unfit to lead society. With education should come better powers of argument and persuasion, a stricter sense of honor. With education should come better powers of argument and persuasion, a stricter sense of honor, and a greater general effectiveness. With these advantages, the educated classes must undoubtedly appeal to the less educated and try to convert them to their way of thinking. But this is a process which is good for both sets of people. Indeed, it is the best possible process for the training of freemen, educated or uneducated, rich or poor. It is often assumed that the educated classes become impotent in a democracy because the representatives of these classes are not exclusively chosen to public office. This argument is a very fallacious one. It assumes that the public offices are the places of greatest influence, whereas in the United States at least, that is conspicuously not the case. In a democracy, it is important to discriminate influence from authority. Rulers and magistrates may or may not be the persons of influence, but many persons of influence never become rulers, magistrates, or representatives in parliaments or legislatures. The complex industries of a modern state and its innumerable corporation services offer great fields for administrative talent which were entirely unknown to preceding generations, and these new activities attract many ambitious and capable men more strongly than the public service. These men are not on that account lost to their country or to society. The present generation has wholly escaped from the conditions of earlier centuries when able men who were not great landowners but had three outlets for their ambition, the army, the church, or the national civil service. The national service, whether in an empire, a limited monarchy, or a republic, is now only one of the many fields which offer to able and patriotic men an honorable and successful career. Indeed, legislation and public administration necessarily have a very second-hand quality, and more and more legislators and administrators become dependent on the researches of scholars, men of science, and historians, and follow in the footsteps of inventors, economists, and political philosophers. Political leaders are very seldom leaders of thought. They are generally trying to induce masses of men to act on principles thought out long before. Their skill is in the selection of practicable approximations to the ideal. Their arts are arts of exposition and persuasion. Their honor comes from fidelity under trying circumstances to familiar principles of public duty. The real leaders of American thought in this century have been preachers, teachers, jurists, seers, and poets. While it is of the highest importance under any form of government that the public servants should be men of intelligence, education, and honor, it is no objection to any given form that under its large numbers of educated and honorable citizens have no connection with the public service. Well-to-do Europeans, when reasoning about the working of democracy, often assume that under any government the property holders are synonymous with the intelligent and educated class. That is not the case in the American democracy. 
Anyone who has been connected with a large American university can testify that democratic institutions produce plenty of rich people who are not educated and plenty of educated people who are not rich, just as medieval society produced illiterate nobles and cultivated monks. Persons who object to manhood suffrage as a last resort for the settlement of public questions are bound to show where, in all the world, a juster or more practicable regulation or convention has been arrived at. The objectors ought at least to indicate where the ultimate decision should, in their judgment, rest, as, for example, with the landowners or the property holders or the graduates of secondary schools or the professional classes. He would be a bold political philosopher who, in these days, should propose that the ultimate tribunal should be constituted in any of these ways. All the experience of the civilized world fails to indicate a safe personage, a safe class, or a safe minority, with which to deposit this power of ultimate decision. On the contrary, the experience of civilization indicates that no select person or class can be trusted with that power, no matter what the principle of selection. The convention that the majority of males shall decide public questions has obviously great recommendations. It is apparently fairer than the rule of any minority, and it is sure to be supported by an adequate physical force. Moreover, its decisions are likely to enforce themselves. Even in matters of doubtful prognostication, the fact that a majority of the males do the prophesying tends to the fulfillment of the prophecy. At any rate, the adoption or partial adoption of universal male suffrage by several civilized nations as coincident with unexampled ameliorations in the condition of the least fortunate and most numerous classes of the population. To this general amelioration many causes have doubtless contributed, but it is reasonable to suppose that the acquisition of the power which comes with votes had something to do with it. Timid or conservative people often stand aghast at the possible directions of democratic desire or at some of the predicated results of democratic rule. But meantime, the actual experience of the American democracy proves, one, that property has never been safer under any form of government, two, that no people have ever welcomed so ardently new machinery and new inventions generally, three, that religious toleration was never carried so far and never so universally accepted, four, that nowhere have the power and disposition have been read so general. 5. That nowhere has government power been more adequate or more freely exercised to levy and collect taxes, to raise armies and to disband them, to maintain public order and to pay off great public debts, national, state, and town. 6. That nowhere have property and well-being been so widely diffused. And 7. That no form of government ever inspired greater affection and loyalty or prompted to greater personal sacrifices in supreme moments. In view of these solid facts, speculations as to what universal suffrage would have done in the 17th and 18th centuries, or may do in the 20th, seem futile indeed. The most civilized nations of the world have all either adopted this final appeal to manhood suffrage, or they are approaching that adoption by rapid stages. The United States, having no customs or traditions of any opposite sort to overcome, have led the nations in this direction and have had the honor of devising, as a result of practical experience, the best safeguards for universal suffrage, safeguards which, in the main, are intended to prevent hasty public action or action based on sudden discontents or temporary spasms of public feeling. These checks are intended to give time for discussion and deliberation or, in other words, to secure the enlightenment of the voters before the vote. If, under new conditions, existing safeguards prove insufficient, the only wise course is to devise new safeguards. The United States have made to civilization a fourth contribution of a very hopeful sort to which public attention needs to be directed. Less temporary evils connected therewith should prevent the continuation of this beneficent action. The United States have furnished a demonstration that people belonging to a great variety of races or nations are, under favorable circumstances, fit for political freedom. It is the fashion to attribute to the enormous immigration of the last 50 years some of the failures of the American political system, and particularly the American failure in municipal government and the introduction in a few states of the rule of the irresponsible party foremen known as bosses. Impatient of these evils, and hastily accepting this improbable explanation of them, some people wish to depart from the American policy of welcoming immigrants.
In two respects, the absorption of large numbers of immigrants from many nations in the American Commonwealth has been of great service to mankind. In the first place, it is demonstrated that people who at home have been subject to every sort of aristocratic or despotic or military oppression become within less than a generation serviceable citizens of a republic and, in the second place, the United States have thus educated to freedom many millions of men. Furthermore, the comparatively high degree of happiness and prosperity enjoyed by the people of the United States has been brought home to multitudes in Europe by friends and relatives who have emigrated to this country, and has commended free institutions to them in the best possible way. This is a legitimate propaganda vastly more effective than any annexation or conquest of unwilling people or of people unprepared for liberty. It is a great mistake to suppose that the process of assimilating foreigners began in this century. The 18th century provided the colonies with a great mixture of peoples, although the English race predominated then as now. When the revolution broke out, there were already English, Irish, Scotch, Dutch, Germans, French, Portuguese, and Swedes in the colonies. The French were, to be sure, in small proportion and were almost exclusively Huguenot refugees but they were a valuable element in the population. The Germans were well diffused, having established themselves in New York, Pennsylvania, Virginia, and Georgia. The Scotch were scattered through all the colonies. Pennsylvania especially was inhabited by an extraordinary mixture of nationalities and religions. Since steam navigation on the Atlantic and railroad transportation of the North American continent became cheap and easy, the tide of immigration has greatly increased, but it is very doubtful if the amount of assimilation going on in the 19th century has been any larger in proportion to the population and wealth of the country than it was in the 18th. The main difference in the assimilation going on in the two centuries is this that in the 18th century the newcomers were almost all Protestants, while in the 19th century a considerable proportion have been Catholics. One result, however, of the importation of large numbers of Catholics in the United States has been a profound modification of the Roman Catholic Church in regard to the manners and customs of both the clergy and the laity, the scope of the authority of the priest, and the attitude of the Catholic Church toward the public education. This American modification of the Roman Church has reacted strongly on the Church in Europe. Another great contribution to civilization made by the United States is the diffusion of material well-being among the population. No country in the world approaches the United States in this respect. It is seen in that diffused elementary education which implants for life a habit of reading and in the habitual optimism which characterizes the common people. It is seen in the housing of the people and their domestic animals, in the comparative costliness of their food, clothing, and household furniture, in their implements, vehicles, and means of transportation, and in the substitution, on a prodigious scale, of the work of machinery for the work of men's hands. This last item in American well-being is quite as striking in agriculture, mining, and fishing as it is in manufactures. The social effects of the manufacture of power and the discovery of means of putting that power just where it is wanted have been more striking in the United States than anywhere else. Manufactured and distributed power needs intelligence to direct it. The bicycle is a blind horse and must be steered at every instant. Somebody must show a steam drill where to strike and how deep to go. So far as men and women can substitute for the direct expenditure of muscular strength, the more intelligent form of designing, tending, and guiding machines, they win promotion in the scale of being and make their lives more interesting as well as more productive. It is in the invention of machinery for producing and distributing power and at once economizing and elevating human labor that American ingenuity has been most conspicuously manifested. The high price of labor in a sparsely settled country has had something to do with this striking result, but the genius of the people and of their government has had much more to do with it. As proof of the general proposition, it suffices merely to mention the telegraph and telephone, the sewing machine, the cotton gin, the mower, reaper, the threshing machine, the dishwashing machine, the river steamboat, the sleeping car, the boot and shoe machinery, and the watch machinery. The ultimate effects of these and kindred inventions are quite as much intellectual as physical, and they are developing and increasing with a proportionate rapidity which sometimes suggested doubt whether the bodily forces of men and women are adequate to resist the new mental strains brought upon them. 
However, this may prove to be in the future the clear result in the present as an unexampled diffusion of well-being in the United States. These five contributions to civilization, peacekeeping, religious toleration, the development of manhood suffrage, the welcoming of newcomers, and the diffusion of well-being, I hold to have been eminently characteristic of our country, and so important that, in spite of the qualifications and deductions which every candid citizen would admit with regard to every one of them, they will ever be held in the grateful remembrance of mankind. They are reasonable grounds for a steady glowing patriotism. They have had much to do, both as causes and as effects, with the material prosperity of the United States, but they are all five essentially moral contributions, being triumphs of reason, enterprise, courage, faith, and justice, over passion, selfishness, inertness, timidity, and distrust. Beneath each one of these developments there lies a strong ethical sentiment, a strenuous and moral social purpose. It is for such work that multitudinous democracies are fit. In regard to all five of these contributions, the characteristic policy of our country has been from time to time threatened with reversal, is even now so threatened. It is for true patriots to insist on the maintenance of these historic purposes and policies of the people of the United States. Our country's future perils, whether already visible or still unimagined, are to be met with courage and constancy founded firmly on these popular achievements in the past. End of Five American Contributions to Civilization by Charles William Eliot, read by Andrea Dion.